everyone. Welcome back to Naomi's Bookshelf. We are going to discuss my thoughts on The Woman in White. Spoiler alert, I loved it. So for The Woman in White, I have been reading it for all of October and for all of November. This one took me two months to read uh, just due to health reasons. I wasn't able to focus on it and I didn't want to read it when I wasn't able to engross myself. So I definitely took my time intentionally with this one. Now we're going to talk about, first of all, non-spoiler section and brief synopsis. Uh, and then we'll go into my thoughts about it. Now, this story is about a man named Walter Hartwright, who I hope I'm saying his last name correctly. Uh, he is a master of drawing. He's a drawing master, I think it was that he was called, or an artist. He basically teaches others how to do art. And he is commissioned to go and work for a family and help the two daughters learn to draw. Now, on his way there, he even comes across a woman who is dressed completely in white and she had needs help getting away. He does not understand why, but she needs to get to London. So he gets her on the stagecoach to London and like the next second, someone comes up and they are looking for her as she has escaped from an asylum. Now, this is kind of the jump start where he's really confused. She goes to this home to take these two students under his wing, teach them drawing. Um, and he starts to really discuss with one of the girls, whose name is Marion, um, about this woman in white. And it kind of is a ghost haunting him over and over again. Meanwhile, the other girl, who's Marion's sister, her name is Laura. He, she is beautiful. And um, Walter kind of falls in love with her instantly. And it's about this pull of this is a mystery. So something's going on with this woman in white, but there's also something going on with his family and Walter's telling his story. And then later you get Marion's perspective in her journal entries as well as other characters. So I'm not going to spoil who else makes an appearance. However, I do have to say this was such a great book. Uh, this did not feel long. It felt so fast paced when I was reading it and the mystery was so clever. I really, really enjoyed it. I did catch a couple things um, from the get go, but honestly, when you read as many mysteries and thrillers as I do, you're bound to catch some stuff. Other stuff completely escaped my notice. I definitely enjoyed this plot development, the characters. I also really, really enjoyed uh, the different dynamics that were in here. I really enjoyed Marianne's relationship with Walter as they were more of a brother-sister relationship or best friends as opposed to romantic and that was a great relationship to see um, in the beginning of the book when they were student and teacher but more like hanging out kind of friends um, and I just can't say enough about this book that I really enjoyed it without spoiling anymore so my recommendation is pick it up. Also, I had the audiobook of it. I'll put a picture here of it. It was a full cast as there are multiple perspectives some that you read this from. So I would highly recommend checking out that audiobook. It was incredible. So on to what I think about the spoiler sections. Now, I definitely caught on that there was a familial relationship going on at the beginning between Anne and uh, Laura at the beginning. I knew something was off. Um, it wasn't just as simple as they look alike. I figured out pretty early on they were family, whether they be cousins or something different. And obviously they were later half sisters. So that was later self-expressed. And I was like, I knew it, I knew it. I really also enjoyed this, um, Count Fosco character, like he was interesting. He kept my intrigue going. And at parts I felt like he was on Marion's side. And then at other parts I was like, don't trust him, don't trust him. And she didn't trust him, but at the same time I was starting to trust him. And then I was telling myself not to trust him. It was a weird relationship with Count Fosco in this book. I definitely was confused and that was a really great place to be in. I really enjoyed the dynamic between um, 
like I said, Marion and Walter, especially like my favorite part of that relationship was at the end when Walter was dealing with the aftermath of Laura being alive and not actually uh, being dead. Um, and she was going after, <laughs> after the truth in her own way, writing letters while taking care of Laura. And while Walter was going out and taking care of business as a man in Victorian times, but he knew that he could trust Marion to handle things at home. That was great. I really appreciated the trust that he put in Marion. And he didn't just put aside her weak, her as a weak woman. Like she was strong and she was clever. And the fact that the Count did not uh, trust her to fall prey to their plans, he, he knew that she was smart. And that's because she just proved herself over and over again of how to get the best of every, um, of what was there for Laura, of every situation for Laura. She did not care about herself, she cared about Laura, and that was so evident. Uh, yeah, I really loved Marion's character. I just thought she was such a great, great female character. You could tell the repression <laughs> that Victorian women had to deal with, um, being put in those situations where you cannot react because you are a woman and not a man. And I did not enjoy that. But at the same time, it's a Victorian novel. I cannot fight the Victorian novel for having a Victorian perspective uh, because that's what I'm getting into when I pick up a Victorian book. <laughs> it's just what part of life. Now, I did also really appreciate though how it showed that Marion could have done those things had society been different. Like uh, when she sneaks out of her bedroom window to go and listen to the men above and on the roof, she goes onto the roof and listens to them. I was just blown away. That was so clever. Um, and she was just like sticking her neck out there for trouble. And she's like, I gotta do it. But she did it. Like I was just so impressed with her and I was so happy to see that she actually followed through with that plan um, and that she just kept going. Like she did not cower to anyone unless she knew it was in the best interest of Laura, which was very important to her. Now, something else that was really interesting about this book was the fact of law and evidence um, and also false testimony. I found that to be an interesting fact of this book because essentially, um, if you're watching this and you have no you've never read this book before and you have no knowledge of what goes on, you just want to know the spoilers. Um, this book is just a bunch of information about this case. It's basically a, a chunk of a manuscript that a lawyer would have in this case um, to go to court. It's all the witness testimony, it's all of the documentation. That's what this book is. It's nothing more, nothing less. It's completely um, done in a great way, but it doesn't look like it at the beginning, but it is. So in this book, you're following obviously the different perspectives as they're written, have they, they've written their testimony down as it relates to this. So even having the scullery maid tell her testimony to someone about how she saw Lady Glyde uh, dead and then also have the tombstone there, and also have the doctor's um, note there of how she died. All of those things were really important and really critical to the plot. Um, and when she died, I was like, no, that can't happen. I was like, they can't have killed Laura. They just killed Laura and I was so, so mad. Um, and then when I found out they killed, Anne, when, not they killed Anne, but Anne died, I was so mad, but I was, I was shocked. They shocked me. That's just what happened. It was so good. I can't tell you enough how good it was. Now, also with this, um, with those evidence and case facts, it was such an interesting thing to see how people, far people would go to hide the truth and how Walter had to go so far to find the truth, um, how he had to really put out the effort in regards to I don't even, even like going and visiting everyone and abandoning an income just to go and find these people to talk to and try to get the information out of. And um, <laughs> even the church burning and Percival dying in there, he deserved it, but he should have gotten justice in the courts, honestly. That would have been more deserving. But at the same time, it was like, that's an awful way to go. So 
ugh, that would have been bad. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, also, it's quite a crazy story of just this of evidence following where it's like someone gathered the true crime documents after the fact, which is crazy. Uh, also with Marion's journal, that ending was such an intense moment because of that. It was just as if someone had stopped writing their journal. So I was very <laughs> scared for Marion at that moment. And then Count Fosco's note in there also made me infuriated. Um, infuriating, infuriatingly mad. I was so frustrated with Count Fosco at that moment in a good way, because he's a good character. Like, he's not a good person, but he's a good character, I, I gotta say. Uh, I don't know what else to say about him, <laughs> to be honest. Oh man, uh, yeah, evidence about this book. I also really enjoyed how the following through of the date that was really critical and how Everything rested on what day Laura left and what day she died. That was such a good po good moment to read. Um, and the conclusion of that, the going to that point was so great. I really enjoyed the different workings of everyone's um, thought processes and how all of the people involved, even the housekeeper, when she was writing her testimony down, she's like, I don't remember what day it was. Like, why would she remember aside from it's late July? Like, why would you remember that exact date unless it has some meaning to you, unless you were involved in the crime? So that was very interesting. Also, I really uh, thought the ending was good with Count Fosco uh, getting his own just desserts. Uh, in some interesting way that was quite intriguing uh, with all of the Italian spy group and government anti-government policies or whatever that was a ride <laughs> that was a ride I'd never expected going into this but it was like all right something's different in this and I enjoyed every second of it honestly I really enjoyed this book uh, what else do I want to talk about I'm trying to figure out, there was just so many good things. I can't believe I wasn't even gonna say anything about Sir Percival's secret um, and how that whole jump-started this book, honestly. So the fact that this is a thing where um, Anne, she knew this idea of a secret, but she didn't know what the secret was. I also found that her, side note, I also knew, found that her representation of mental illness was, um, not great, but also kind of a created one. Um, it wasn't like an awful representation, but I'm also not, I don't have that mental illness, so I'm not able to speak on that representation. So I felt like that was also something where I was like, is this um, just an author from Victorian era think did this doing what he thinks is right, or is this accurate? I was unsure, but I've also read 10 Days in a Madhouse by Nellie Bly, and she said in that, um, where she went and undercover, went into a madhouse, that being there made her go actually feel like she was going crazy or going mad. Um, and so being in a madhouse or being in an asylum, Anne probably was feeling that way too. Anyways, <clears throat> so when Anne feels like she has a secret to hold over Percival's head, I keep wanting to call him Percy, by the way, um, she, it's such an interesting character with that like knowledge. She, that knowledge gives her power. It gives her this daring, recluse, risk-taking ability where she can just jump in and then she goes back into this self-preserve because she doesn't actually know the secret. So she's reclusive, but she's also daring with it. And it's quite an interesting paradox also because then Percival is just terrified for his life that she knows the actual secret. And he's paranoid even though he's been told that she doesn't know it. And then also being told that his wife knows the secret, even though she doesn't. It's just such an interesting paradox for this book to be built on. Also, I wanna talk about the title. Um, the Woman in White is such an interesting title and interesting portrayal of the book. So, because this book is really about two women in white. It's about Anne, who always wears white and really is the jumpstart of this whole plot uh, as she, well, not maybe the whole plot, but for most of it, at least for Percival's need for money, as her mother saw this whole thing go down, where he suddenly is able to borrow money on his land, um, on his land's title name, and suddenly he is owing a lot of money, 
and so he needs money to marry Laura. So, or he needs Laura's money so they get married. But Laura also wears white all the time, just like her mother used to as well. So this is whole woman in white, like which, who is the woman in white that this book is about? Is it about Laura? Is it about Anne? Who is it? Is it both? I don't know. I also found that to be just an interesting dynamic because they were so, um, so much like a mirror of each other. I don't know if that makes sense, but it felt like Anne was an older version of Laura. Um, even like maybe not the marriage part, but pre-marriage, it just seemed like Anne could have been that young carefree girl. Um, and then when they both end up, they both ended up in an asylum at different points in their life. And Laura could have gone that down that same path, which would have been very sad. So it was kind of like two, uh, two sides of the same coin or a mirror of the same person. Um, but different options. It was just an interesting view of it for me. Also, something else about this was the whole marriage idea. Um, <laughs> the marriages that were represented in here are very interesting. So you have per uh, Percival and Laura who uh, are not a healthy marriage by any standards, who's Percival's only with her for the money and she is only with him because she promised she would and she's in love with. Walter, that's never gonna be a good situation for anyone. And Percival is quite a jealous and powerful man um, and promises to make her pay for falling in love with Walter. That's never gonna end well. Also, then you have Count Fosco and his wife, who is Laura's aunt, which was really interesting, that relationship, because she is such a, um, his, her aunt, Lady Fosco, or Countess Fosco, not Lady. Countess Fosco, um, Eleanor, I guess actually is her first name. She was described as being such a strong, powerful woman until she married her husband. And then she married him and she became this cowering woman who rolls cigarettes. That's all that she does all day long. <laughs> A sneeze is coming. A sneeze is coming. Anyway, so she rolls cigarettes for him all day and then she is um, stony silent. She doesn't care about anyone. And she only does her husband's bidding, even to the point of stealing letters from a former maid's chest, like down her shirt, down her dress. That's the point that she gets to. And it's like, what happened? to this woman and she's betraying her own net niece, like her two nieces, to the point where they both um, could, they both could die and she's sending one to an asylum. Like that's what she's doing. It's just, she was an interesting woman to read about and I didn't really like that. But at the same time, it was like, this is a mar part of marriage that's cowering. And also Marianne's description of Count Fosco um, with him being able to tame anyone was disturbing as well. It was disturbing to hear that he could tame even the wildest of women. Um, and she felt herself being tamed by him and she refused. And that showed how strong she was. So I was kind of creeped out by him in that way. But they also have the marriage of Walter and Laura, which isn't really looked at, it's just at the end. And that was good to see, but it was also, it was like, it kind of just, it didn't come out of nowhere, but it also just was like, we didn't get a lot of screen time. And I do think that the author addressed that when he, as Walter said, I didn't talk about things that didn't matter to the story. Like my parent, my mother, not knowing about, or not caring about my marriage until, um, you know, she was able to accept my wife or about certain aspects with different relationships, different friendships. So in that regard, I could get it. I could stand behind it. Um, and so I definitely felt like that maybe didn't play a big part of that. However, him being married to her was very important to him. So I wish I could have a little bit more of that. However, I am gonna end my review here, I think, cause I don't know what else to say aside from rave about it. There were so many things in this book. Um, gender roles was also interesting to look at, but 
the law and effort and how the law was so easily tricked and also how the law was had the process to get the law redeeming Laura as alive was such an interesting and long journey for all of the characters. So yeah, I definitely loved this book. I am going to give it a five out of five stars. And then I also today when I was out book shopping, um, <laughs> cause what else do you do? I picked up the Moonstone by Wilkie Collins. So I just love the looks of these covers, honestly. This, these editions are great. So I'm not sure when I'll pick up this one, but The Woman in White was a great introduction to Wilkie Collins and I am excited to read more from Wilkie Collins. So this was my last, maybe not last, but we'll see, a timeless tome for 2020. I will be reading Mary Barton in December. So that will be coming out, my thoughts on that maybe January. Um, or maybe late December if I finish it in time that I don't plan on having it finished before the 31st. So we'll just see how that goes with Mary Barton, but I am excited to pick that one up next. So I hope you are all doing well, enjoying classics, big classics. If you've read The Woman in White, please let me know what your thoughts are. If you love it, if you don't, why for either or down the comments below. Also, if you have any recommendations for any other Wilkie Collins I should prioritize, I would love to hear your thoughts of that as well. So I hope to see you all in another video soon. If you like this video, please subscribe. I do a lot of classics content and big classics. I will link the playlist for my timeless tomes, all of my giant classics that I've read um, in the cards as well as down below in the description box. But also if you are enjoying thrillers or mysteries or anything of those kinds, I read a lot of books and a lot of genres. So please subscribe if you would like to for more content from me and also give this video a big thumbs up <laughs> if you would like. I will see you next time with another video. Bye for now.